The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. At Bastrop, you're looking at a historic buildup of fuels which provided for conditions that were extremely volatile. It was primed to go and it, it, and it took off like a shot. I think lots of times people don't realize that whatever's on the ground will end up in the bay in the end. So during the egg laying process, these flooded pools are very important to wood duck production. Texas Parks and Wildlife, taking Texans outside for 30 years. Get out of its way and get to the other side of the This is a story about some special people. Meet Kevin Ferguson and Robin Dabney. Kevin runs both Kickapoo Cavern State Park and Devil's Sinkhole. And Robin, well, she's doing the dirty work at Dinosaur Valley State Park. Besides working in our state parks, they are also firefighters. Volunteer firefighters, and this is a look into what it takes to be on the fire line with the State Parks Wildland Fire Team. Here at Cedar Hill State Park, south of Dallas, a prescribed burn is underway to help restore the park's native Blackland Prairie. It's an extremely rare habitat that we are trying to manage. Uh, Cedar Hill has, in our state park system, probably the best representation of Blackland Prairie, and we're managing to kind of restore it back to its natural diversity. Uh, the way this stuff is brushy here, we want to get down and around the end. For Kevin, he is in training. You want to split him into two? Yeah. Okay. A so test yeah. to so see I mean, if he has what it takes to be a future firing boss. The fire behavior is, is very good. We're, we're getting what we want. This woody debris is moving out into the prairies. And we're getting good behavior in there, taking a lot of that stuff with it. We're happy with what we're getting. For Robin, this is just her third prescribed burn. You have to keep moving, and it's a really intense thing being out there. It's exciting. It's, it's sort of an adrenaline rush. Um, you're walking. You can see the fire dripping. You can hear the trees, the grasses igniting, uh, and you can feel the heat for sure. All right, let's move. It's about to get hot. The team's goal is to burn and help restore five to 10,000 acres of parkland every year, all as volunteers as their daily duties continue back at the office. I love my day-to-day -day job that I do at the park, but um, being brought into something that, that you feel is, is not only this important, but is this exciting as well. It's just a passion when you really believe in something like that, it's, you know, you make it happen. It's neat to come out and be able to work on a project that from start to finish you can accomplish in one day. See all the grass, see the trees beforehand. Drag the fire, everything lights up. And then it's black. So you can really see it through all the stages from beginning to end. And it's neat, it feels good. Like you accomplished something.
We're going to run two heats today. 45 pounds. To be part of the fire team, every year the firefighters have to pass a fitness run of sorts. Always a little nervous, but excited as well. Uh, this will be the fifth year running, so uh, it's fun. <laughs> I've gotten out and walked some. I've carried a little bit of weight, but I haven't actually gotten to carry the 45 pounds yet. Um, so I've kind of been nervous waking up with nightmares leading, <laughs> leading up to this. Heavy. <laughs> Ready, set, go. I have to walk 45 minutes with a 45 pound pack, um, three miles. So it's, it's a big ordeal. <laughs> Somebody's chasing me! <laughs> the point of it is to walk, you're not allowed to run, so one foot on the ground at all times. Going strong. Over halfway. This is this is five. So we'll get called out on wildfires, prescribed burns, and some of these last for a week, two weeks at a time, and you're hiking up in Fort Davis area or Cap Rock where there's hills. 30 seconds ahead. And so this is just kind of a test to make sure that you're in shape and capable to do all of that year round. My feet are starting to hurt. <laughs> And I'm feeling the 45 pounds. <laughs> you could be going for uh, you know longer than 12 hours. You could really be tested on your physical ability, and this is one way to get a snapshot of what you can handle. <laughs> Good run. I talk to myself the whole way, and I listen to music and close my eyes, whatever I have to do, and I get through it. I need help. <laughs> I feel relieved, for sure, now that it's over. See you next year. Hundreds of homes destroyed in one of the worst wildfire outbreaks in Central Texas history. The biggest burning in and around Bastrop State Park right now. More than 25,000 acres. Again, 476 homes destroyed. 2011 proved to be the most devastating wildfire season in Texas history. At Bastrop, Kevin was one of the first on the scene. At Bastrop, you're looking at a historic buildup of fuels which provided for conditions that were extremely volatile. It was primed to go and it, and it took off like a shot. I get around them all, come back there and look at it with you. We went straight for over 48 hours before getting any sleep, and then it was an hour here and an hour there, and we never knew it was going to be like that, and you had to be prepared to be able to endure whatever's thrown at you, especially in an emergency situation like that. Earlier in April, fires hit Possum Kingdom State Park, and it was Robin's first wildfire. When the fire came over at Possum Kingdom, we knew it would take out the vegetation. We knew it would take out everything that was in its path that we weren't able to protect. But we went in and we dug around some of the structures, tried to protect the houses. We tried to protect the cabins as well, and, and everything there survived. Both fires burned thousands of acres of parkland. But the team was able to save all the park's historic structures and cabins. An ember fell in the crotch of that juniper tree. The training and qualifications of our state park firefighters allowed our firefighters to quickly flip a switch from a prescribed fire mode to a wildland firefighting mode. We were able to protect our park infrastructure, protect our park natural resources and cultural resources, and save these state legacies, our state parks. fire team here has, has proved through multiple wildfires that all of their firefighters are well trained and can work together um, to accomplish something and, and in this case it was protecting buildings and saving parks. As a team, training together, uh, working together, we're ready and we've learned what it takes to be effective and to be safe and 
whatever happens, we're ready to go. Six-year-old Jack Tunnel enjoys time on the Corpus Christi shoreline with his dad. Dad, my shoes got wet. Uh -oh. We only live two blocks from Cole Park, so. Oh, that one worked. We come down here pretty often since we live so close. Very convenient place. It's just a beautiful place to be. But after a rain, what they see here is not always so pretty. Whoa, now that's nasty. Urban trash can cause trouble for both freshwater and saltwater ecosystems. It is a problem Jace Tunnel is familiar with through his work for local coastal conservation groups. Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Programs, Jace. We deal a lot with trying to solve the water quality issues that we have. Uh, bay debris is part of that. You know, any trash that goes into the bay, like plastics, it takes many, many years for that to be able to biodegrade. And it's not pretty to see, but it's also bad for the animals. When it rains, I think lots of times people don't realize that whatever's on the ground will end up in the bay in the end. To raise awareness, Jace grabbed his video camera during a rainfall and captured much more than stormwater flowing out to sea. It blew my mind to see how much trash was coming out. And unfortunately, that's just the stuff that floats. I was showing it to Jack and his eyes just opened up and he said, you know, whoa. Whatever trash is on the road and it rains is gonna get washed into the bay. Oh, yeah. So father and son made a short video. All the cups. And a plea to keep we'll all the cups there. from harming the environment. I like this part. You like this part? Yeah. Okay. You want people to stop throwing trash everywhere and um, that's all. All right. Coincidentally, as their video hit YouTube, the city was launching its own anti-litter campaign. It takes a lot of different approaches to address the issue. We've had a lot of news media, uh, advertisements, an app that was developed, TV commercials. Only you can stop the wrath of trash. Don't litter. And the overall goal of it is to bring litter awareness to everyone in the city. We do have a beautiful city and we want to keep it that way. We want to remain the sparkling city by the sea. The challenges being faced in Corpus are by no means unique. There is concern worldwide about the impacts of trash on marine life. But this complex problem is nicely summed up by young Jack. Don't throw the trash in the water. Um, fish and birds eat it, and they get so hungry that they die. All the Cups has yet to go as viral as, say, stray cups and bottles, but the video has been seen by thousands. And as more see how quickly litter can pollute a waterway, perhaps more will choose to recycle, or at least dispose of their trash responsibly. Anything on the ground, just make sure you pick it up. Whether it's trash, oil, whatever's on the ground, it's gonna end up in the bay, it's gonna end up in the waterways. So the main take home is, uh, you know, awareness. A little awareness and personal responsibility can keep our waters clean and fish and wildlife healthy. Whoa, look at this rock. Oh. And that makes for happier days at the beach. Perfect, then you really know how to pick them out. Wish you could spend more time with nature? Well, every month you can have the great outdoors delivered to you. Since 1942, Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine has been the outdoor magazine of Texas. Every issue is packed with outstanding photography and writing about the wild things and wild places of this great state. And now, Texas's best outdoor magazine is available as an app. It's just that easy. Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, your connection to the great outdoors. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. 
To celebrate this milestone, we're taking a look back at some of the interesting stories and unique characters that we've discovered over the past three decades. In 1989, we explored the unique hardwood bottomland ecosystem of the Ingling Wildlife Management Area in East Texas. Dawn in early spring on an East Texas beaver pond. A wood duck rises to meet the challenges this new day will bring. Every creature on Earth has basic needs, food, water, and adequate space to live and reproduce. In short, we are all dependent on habitat. All over the world, the pressures of development carve away and otherwise alter the natural world. No one really owns the land. We merely serve as stewards. Time will judge the worth of our term by what is left for the stewards of the future. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department operates numerous wildlife management areas across Texas' different ecological zones. Here in East Texas, the Engling Wildlife Management Area encompasses half of the Catfish Creek ecosystem, one of the few high-quality spring-fed hardwood bottomlands remaining in the Gulf Coast Plain Natural Area. Historically, land use in this area has systematically carved away the hardwoods. Much of the area was cleared for farmland. Lumbering and firewood cutting removed additional acreage. Farms evolved into ranches as croplands became pastures for grazing livestock. Today, livestock and hay production remain the principal land use in the region. Surrounded by a sea of coastal Bermuda grass pasture lands, the Engling Wildlife Management Area is like an island of hardwood bottomland habitat, so unique it has been designated a national natural landmark. This means the Department of the Interior recognizes this section of Catfish Creek as having national significance in illustrating the natural heritage of the United States. One of the more prominent citizens of this ecosystem is the wood duck. These wood duck hens, satisfied after a morning of feeding, seek a refreshing drink to begin their loafing period. Wood ducks are appropriately named. They live in swamps and ponds and nest inside trees. Their diet, physical characteristics, and seasonal behavior all correspond to specific facets of the woodlands. Today, the major threat to wood ducks comes from the loss or alteration of woodland habitats. Well, nowadays we hear a lot about uh, the detrimental effects of flooding, stream flooding, and certainly there are some uh, damages that occur, but let me show you some things that are valuable, particularly to waterfowl and specifically here to wood ducks. It has two benefits. One, it keeps the, the main wetland out there charged with water, and that's where our brood habitat is. But there's another uh, benefit to, to wood ducks, and that is when the hen is laying eggs, she has to gather enough protein and calcium every day to produce another egg, and she does that by feeding in these slack water situations. These slack water situations are full of, of uh, invertebrates, macroinvertebrates we call them. So during the egg laying process, these flooded pools are very important to wood duck production. When the end of incubation nears and the eggs are close to hatching, the hen becomes more and more reluctant to leave the nest, even during Carl's annual survey of the nest boxes. Then a wood duck hen, if you approach and she's either in a natural cavity or in a nest box and you can get her to jump out, she may just jump in the water or the ground in front of you and go flopping off and squealing and acting like she's crippled and 
just about to die. And if you're a predator and after a quick lunch, your natural tendency would be to follow this hen because there is food right before you and you can't see what's in the box. Once uh, the predator starts chasing her, she has a miraculous recovery and will fly off and leave the would-be predator wondering what happened. All of these maternal responses indicate that very shortly, something very special is going to happen in Box 98. Since all the eggs began incubation on the same day, they will also hatch on the same day. This is an exhausting process, and it may take the chicks several hours to free themselves from the shell. Finally, all the fertile eggs have produced hatched ducklings. Fatigue overcomes the brood, and the chicks sleep soundly in preparation for their introduction to the world. The next morning, other wood ducks begin their normal routine, just as any other spring day. At nest box 98, however, the wood duck hen is not so relaxed. Her chicks, hatched and dry, slept overnight, and today they are finally ready to exit the safety of the box. Box 98's Drake becomes a diligent sentry at attention, watching all directions for any predator that could threaten the brood. When she feels the coast is clear, the hen will call the ducklings out of the box and into the world. The ducklings begin foraging immediately for their first meal. They have not completely imprinted on their mother yet, and the distraction of hunger makes them vulnerable. The nervous hen calls to the chicks with the same vocalization she made earlier in the nest when the egg showed signs of hatching. Whether the hen rears the brood successfully depends on the quality of the habitat. Wildlife management areas demonstrate techniques for improving the quality of wildlife. They can also be excellent places to simply watch an ecosystem thrive. A new dawn on an East Texas beaver pond. What challenges will this new day bring? And how will the decisions made today affect the wildlife that belongs to the future?
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.